السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all his prophets and messengers alike including the final messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his followers and his companions alike so dear respected brothers sisters attendees jazakumullah khair for joining in for tuning in to this online webinar part of the new dawa academy series uh, so as you may know there is a series of topics that have been selected and have been carefully selected to meet the needs of the dawa community so again first and foremost may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and reward you all for registering and for attending this session so the first session is regarding the topic of we must convey the message of islam right we must share the message so we're going to focus today for the next 20, 25 minutes or so on the importance of da'wah, its relevance, its objective, and its purpose ultimately in both from, the, from both the Islamic tradition and how it's applicable to the non-Muslim community in the 21st century. So Bismillah, let's first start with the definition of da'wah. So da'wah is a noun, and linguistically speaking, the word da'wah means to call or to invite, it can also mean to invoke, it can mean to summon. And the word da'wah in itself, according to the linguists, actually just means generally to call something or invite some, someone to something specific. So the word da'wah is actually very general. And thus, you can think of da'wah as a general term that could mean to invite, it could entail inviting to something good or to something bad or to something neutral. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word da'wah, the term da'wah, in numerous occasions. For instance, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that if my servant asks you about me, tell them I am near. I answer the call of the caller when they calleth upon me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilizes the term da'wah in this verse in three different literary forms. Da'wah ta da'i idha da'an. So the word da'wah, again, is general and its root word has extensions. Now, in the Islamic tradition, historically speaking, when the term da'wah is used, it's in reference to calling non-Muslims to Islam. That's the default understanding of da'wah in the Islamic tradition, historically speaking. And this is, of course, found very evident in the works of the ulama, such as Ibn, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, such as the works of Ibn Baz, Ibn Taymiyyah, and many others who referenced and utilized the word da'wah in this manner. And so when we look at the Quranic discourse, we see throughout the entire Quran, the word da'wah is referenced on many different occasions. And what we're going to do, inshallah, is actually tie the meaning of da'wah to applicable verses where it's mentioned. So for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nahl in chapter 16, verse 125, Allah says, ila bil hikmah wal mawaidatil hasana wa ahsan. Beautiful verse. It's one of those prominent da'wah verses, in fact. And the meaning of the verse, while we're on it, is profound. And it's an invitation for all of us to be involved in the works of da'wah. Not just that, but it also provides to us the formula as to how we should conduct da'wah per the Quranic discourse, per the Quranic teaching. And so, if we deconstruct this verse, what do we find? First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Adaw, right? Adaw, right away, invite or call. Remember, the word da'wah means to call, to invite. So, Adaw ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. 
invite to the way of your Lord with what? Bil hikma wal mawadatil hasana. So invite to the way of your Lord with both wisdom and beautiful preaching. And then Allah says, and reason with them. Right? The word jadala is in fact used. Wajadilhum. And jadala is something that is allowed in our deen. Jadala means to present reasons, to present arguments. And thus, this is something that's permissible in Islam, is to present arguments, to present reasons, to present rebuttals, and so on. Of course, in the most respected and compassionate manner possible. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, bil hikmah, which targets the mind, wal mawaithat al hasana, which targets the heart, the qalb. Mawaithat al hasana is beautiful preaching. And then Allah says, wajadilhum bil latihi ahsan. And reason with them in a manner that's best. So interestingly, the Quranic formula for da'wah is hikmah, which is intellect. Secondly, it would be mawadat al-hasana, which is beautiful preaching, good words, nice words. And then it says, jadilhum billati ahsan. Reason with them in a manner that's best. And this entails, this involves good manners, good etiquette, good conduct, and good presentation overall. So the next verse that we find where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references da'wah, many are many verses, subhanAllah. But one verse that we want to highlight is actually mentioned in Surah Ali Amran, where Allah says, munkar wa ulaika humul muflihun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and let there arise from you or let there grow out a community or a nation or a small community who do what? Who enjoy in good or invite to good and forbid evil. And then Allah says, And indeed they are, and verily they are the success. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us, dear respected brothers, sisters, youth, attendees. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling every single one of us to rise together as a community. And I see now there's 229 people active. 229 attendees. SubhanAllah, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking and referencing specific gatherings as these. Wallahu alam. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has summoned. And so in 3104, Surah Al-Amran, it's a clear, clear announcement for da'wah. A very clear announcement for all of us to just rise and enjoy in, in da'wah. Now, from the ulama point of view, the scholarly consensus, actually, there is no scholarly consensus as to where, whether this work in terms of da'wah is a fard ayn or a fard kifaya, because there is a difference. A fard ayn meaning that it's a fard, it's an obligation on every single person to give da'wah. So some scholars held this view, other scholars, Ibn Baz, um, Rahimahullah, and others held the view that it's a fard kifaya, meaning it's a fard that is due upon the community or part of the community. So if a part of the community fulfills it, then it's met, the condition is met for the entire ummah. Um, if a part does not, then everyone is held accountable. If no one does it, everyone is held accountable. But scholars also say that fardain is applicable, meaning it's a duty upon us all to conduct dawah to our neighbors, to our family members, to ourselves, and so on. So it can be looked at as fardain in a sense as well, in a perspective. From a theological point of view, from a aqidah point of view, we can say, it makes no sense to follow sam'ana wa atana, which is we hear and obey. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obeyed us, or rather, na'udhu billah, has instructed us to obey him, therefore, we should follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to follow him and obey him. And thus, this is one of the things that he instructed us to do is give da'wah. Now, what's important to mention here is in the same surah, chapter 3, verse 104, a few verses down in verse 110, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually calls us the best nation for the very fact of giving da'wah. So Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna al munkar so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, verse 110, a few verses down, verse 104, Allah says, you are, you are indeed the best nation. You are the best nation. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call us the best nation? Because of the following criteria. Because we enjoy in good, 
forbid evil, and we believe in Allah. So these three characteristics or this criteria, you can say, is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us the best nation. So hence, we should be proud of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us the best nation for the very reason that da'wah is something that is incumbent on us, something that's obligatory, something we should be involved in. So the obligation of giving da'wah ties in with why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us the best nation. And so to proceed, we must also understand that when we conduct da'wah, we have to understand that our duty is to convey the message and not necessarily to convert. If conversion happens, alhamdulillah, this is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we must recognize the very fact that our duty simply is fulfilled when we convey. Think of a conveyor belt, right? You go to an airport, you see a conveyor belt. The message of Islam is similar. You put the message on the conveyor belt and have it take its effect. So our, our position, the Islamic tradition, is that we convey the message. We don't convert people. If conversion happens, this is from the will and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our, our duty is to just convey. And, and that takes patience. And that takes time. And so let's get into the characteristics of of how a person should conduct himself when they're actually giving da'wah. So first of all, we have to be kind and gentle, right? You wanna be kind, you wanna be soft-spoken, you don't wanna be harsh. Soft-heartedness is also very important. Having good manners and a polite tongue, crucial. No ego, no pride, and also having proper body language. So all of these things, your respected attendees, are crucial when you're actually giving da'wah. Character is important, because we know the Prophet ﷺ was the walking Quran, as the hadith sources uh, indicate. And we also know that we should speak on that, only that which we know. So for instance, um, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, that convey my message, even if it's one verse. So if you know that one verse, you convey it. And if there's something you don't know, then you actually take that person's contact if necessary and transfer them to another source of knowledge as deemed necessary. So let's get into the motivations and rewards of da'wah because the main topic of today is actually just about that is is to is regarding the fact that we should convey Islam we should be involved in da'wah right so these are the reasons as to why we should be involved in the works of da'wah first of all giving da'wah is about being a human being it's about humanizing with the creation and of course there's reference to this why because we see that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that, that the Prophet وسلم, said, you are not a true believer until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. Now, of course, some may argue, well, that's referring to Muslims. But in fact, if you look at the work of the ulama, the scholars, you see that Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, he said that this is actually referring to Anas. So when, when the ulama, they analyzed it, they did deductive analysis on these on this specific hadith, they found that it's referring to an nas when you tie it to other hadith, hadith sources, right? So because of that fact, we find that this hadith is actually involving all creation, all of creation. So if da'wah is about being a human being, then we should be involved in this work if we want to humanize with the creation. So giving da'wah allows us to humanize with the creation. And thus, in addition to that, the very next point, it allows us to develop empathy. And empathy was a prophetic trait. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was both sympathetic and empathetic. And there is a difference between sympathy and empathy. Basically, sympathy is when you feel sorry for someone, right? But empathy is a much higher level of psychological connection with a person because being empathetic is when you actually sort of say that I'm not just feeling sorry for you, but I'm also walking in your shoes. So it's almost like you become the person in a sense, right? So it's empathy. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ had. So the Prophet ﷺ was empathetic towards the believers. He was empathetic towards, obviously, the Muslims. He was empathetic towards the animals, the creation, the trees, the environment, even the non-Muslims. SubhanAllah. This Hathayani, this was the Prophet ﷺ. Next point. Those who give da'wah are the best of people. Khairun nas. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. You are indeed the best people. You are the best nation for the very fact that you give da'wah. 
So those who give da'wah are the best of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also called us the best nation for giving da'wah. Then we know, as we know, perhaps, that the rewards of da'wah are immense. They're profound. They're enormous, in fact, to use better terminology. Why is the, is the reward of da'wah enormous? Well, besides the given fact that you're guiding someone to deen al-haq, to the religion of truth, to absolute truth, to objective truth, for the very reason that you're helping to guide them by the will of Allah, we see that the hadith mentions something very interesting. The hadith says that if one person was to be guided by you, it's better than everything in this world and what's in it. The hadith also says that if, you were, if one person was to be guided through you, it's better than a whole lot of red camels. And, you know, to us, this may sound, you know, anachronistic in a sense. It may, it may sound outdated. But when you think about it, red camels at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu were luxury. In fact, there were, there, there, there was a, really as, as much of an asset as you would find gold today. Think about the fact of you walking um, in your driveway and finding a whole bunch of red Lamborghinis, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality of red camels at the time of the Prophet it was seen as luxury you're not just riding a regular camel but you're riding a camel that's red which is more rare thus more um, obviously more expensive and thus more luxury so the rewards of one person being guided through you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course is more rewarding than that so the rewards of da'wah are immense giving da'wah is also self-defining it defines who you are as a human being it defines who you are as a muslim as well because you learn to empathize with the creation and the only way you can empathize with the creation is really when you connect to them on a metaphysical level not just a physical level we deal with people all the time but when you connect with a person's spirituality when you connect to a person's psychological disposition then you allow yourself to connect to them on a metaphysical level and not just a physical level. So giving da'wah is also self-defining in that sense because you come to realize that you're doing the works of the prophets whom peace be upon and you're being involved in actually connecting people metaphysically to their Lord, to their creator. So giving da'wah becomes self-defining in that sense. It gives you purpose and thus it also gives you life, right? Da'wah in itself gives you life. It gives you a purpose. It gives you, it gives you a mission. I mean, that's what all the prophets peace be upon them all did, right? They, they all had a mission and thus it gave them life. It gave them a purpose to life. So giving da'wah also gives us life in that sense. Furthermore, giving da'wah also makes you a companion. We see this referenced. Of course, we mean, what we mean by companion is, is a follower of the Prophet ﷺ and all the prophets, in fact. So for instance, it says in Surah Yusuf, in chapter um, 12, verse 108, قُلْ saying, say, of course, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, So it says, say, O Muhammad. Every time Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, قُلْ, say, O Muhammad, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي. This is my way. What is my way? أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ I call or I invite to Allah. أَنَا وَمَنِ التَّبَعْنِي I and my followers, or I and my companions. And praise be to Allah, I am not of the polytheists. So the verse is very clear that anyone who gives da'wah is a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is thus in that sense a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Moreover, da'wah also connects you to the Qur'an. And you know, it connects you to the Qur'an on multiple levels. First of all, da'wah connects you to the Qur'an in the sense that it makes you a more practical Muslim. I'll say that again. Da'wah connects you to the Qur'an on the level that it makes you a more practical Muslim. Why? How? Well, when you go out and give da'wah, you speak to non-Muslims, whether they're atheists or agnostics or Hindus or Buddhists or spiritualists or humanists or secularists. It doesn't matter. It allows you to connect to them directly and engage with them on Islamic topics. When you engage with non-Muslims on Islamic topics, you will find yourself connecting yourself back to the Quran. Why? Because you come across new arguments. You come across different realms of understandings of others and then you see how the Quran actually speaks about them, number one. Number two, you go back to the Quran to refer back to it when you need an answer to something specific. So if someone comes and asks you, for example, about why alcohol is not allowed, well, to you initially, you're just thinking, well, it's just not allowed because Allah said it. But then when you go back, you see that the Quran has abrogated the laws of alcohol 
in pre-Islamic Arabia, right? And then you see how the abrogation took place and how the final verdict, the final decision was made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it completely forbidden. So that will connect you to the Quran in that sense. It allows you to extract new arguments. It allows you to connect with the Quran on a very intellectual level. And this is what the Quran prompts us to do anyway. The Quran says, Do you not rationalize? Do you not utilize your intellect? Use your intellect. So Dawah connects you to the Quran on that level. Dawah also connects you to the Quran on the level that it increases your Iman. And when your Iman increases, naturally, you're more connected to the Quran. So you'll spend more time with the Quran. You'll read it more. You'll, you'll explore it more. You'll investigate it more. You'll research it more. And so on. So inshallah ta'ala, all of this um, lines up and makes sense. Finally, you are emulating the prophets and messengers. Peace be upon them all. And I think this is one of the most pr profound points. And that's why it's um, saved for last. The reason being, dear respected brothers, sisters, and attendees, and I will say this very bluntly and straightforward, there are no more prophets and messengers to come. This is a given fact that we all know. There are no more prophets and messengers to come. When you think about it, all of the prophets and messengers of Allah came to give da'wah. The Quran was sent as a book of guidance. So even the Quran itself is a book of da'wah in that sense. It enjoins in good and forbids evil. The Torah, same thing. The Injil, same thing. And many of these prophets, or some of these prophets rather, came with revelation, with wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via angel Jibreel. So what we realize is when you are involved in da'wah, you are emulating the best people who walked the face of this earth, i.e. the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of them. But what we need to internalize, we really need to internalize and do some introspection, is that there's no more prophets and messengers to come. And so if we don't propagate the message of Islam, if we don't convey the message of Islam, if we don't inform people about the deen of Allah, then I ask you all, who will? And therefore, in conclusion, I want to say that if we don't convey the message of Islam, then the work of Islam, the message of Islam will not reach the homes of people, will not reach the people and what they need to hear about the truth. And so the interesting thing about this is theoretically, they will still get the message because this is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but practically they won't. So practically, because we have free will, they won't receive the message, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find other means for the message to be sent to them. Then it comes down to us, and I conclude with this point, is that it's on us now if we want to take share in the reward of da'wah or not, because the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will propagate no matter what. The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to rise no matter what. As much as they try to put forward misconceptions, to try to defame Islam and its teachings, Islam will continue to propagate and the misconceptions will be dispelled either by ourselves or others. So we, before we get into the Q&A section, because we've already ran for about 25 minutes, um, I just want to give an overview of how we should speak to people when it comes to da'wah. And we're going to be talking about this in the future, but just for the next minute. When you speak to someone about da'wah, the most important thing, and this ties with what we've talked about, the most important thing is to learn about them. If I can leave you with something today, take that. When you speak to someone about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the deen, about objective truth, understand where they come from, understand their worldview and what led them to their worldview. Then at that point, you can call them to Islam accordingly and realize that you calling them to Islam is the greatest thing that you can do for that person. And if you truly love them, like the Prophet ﷺ said, you have to love them for the sake of humanity, then you would want guidance for them, especially realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Allah, in Surah, in Surah An Nisa, in fact, just to reference it, that Allah does not forget, forgive uh, polytheism. He does not forgive one who associates partners with him, but he can potentially forgive anything else per his will. Also, we see that if a person is Muslim, what do we see in the hadith? Hadith Qudsi, very interestingly, which is hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke through. It says that Allah says, the Prophet said that Allah said, 
إنك لو أتيتني بقراب الأرض خطايا ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيئا لأتيتك بقرابها مغفرة So the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Hadith Qudsi that if one of you were to come with an earth full of sins but you did not associate partners with me I would grant them an earth full of forgiveness Allahu Akbar So this dear respected attendees is what we want to convey to our non-Muslim friends we need to humanize with them we really need to start to get to a level where we let go of ourselves we need to be selfless and realize that they need us they need the message of Islam hence we should be involved in the works of da'wah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also for the sake of humanity let's humanize with the creation inshallah and let's be involved in this work so jazakumullah khair may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all uh, inshallah we'll open the floor if there's any comments if there's any questions inshallah where you want to uh, carry on this conversation exactly mm, okay thank you brother mustafa um so i wanted to introduce uh, our first uh, presenter today brother mustafa hijazi uh, mustafa can you hear me yes no oh okay good so brother mustafa hijazi he's uh he's joined why islam he's been doing dawah for quite some time uh he has joined why islam as a field dawah coordinator and alhamdulillah, he's been very, uh, inshallah, you can follow him. He's on social media. Uh, he's on uh, Facebook at Lisa. That's all I, um, I know. And he's also on uh, other uh, social media sites, inshallah, if you can join him. His, uh, I'll spell his name out. It's Mustafa, M-O-S-T-A-F-A. -A, and uh, last name is Hijazi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. And we have a few questions that we wanted to go through. But before that, uh, I just wanted to let you know, because a lot of questions are coming in and people wanted to know if they'll be able to get the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this uh, webinar is uh, recorded. So uh, all the recordings will be available, inshallah, for you to take, sure. take his religion. Basically, as a Christian that is educated on Islam and Christianity, how do you give advice right. uh, to a person conveying the message of, of, to them? On the association or partnership. So if, if it's an intellectual Christian, the first thing that I would do is understand more about that person's worldview and see what their thoughts are about Islam. What's their background about Islam? What's their level of education, academically speaking, about Islam? Or even just generally, their experiences with Islam. What are their thoughts? Are their thoughts positive regarding Islam? Are their thoughts negative? Now, I wouldn't necessarily jump into the Bible initially, which, which tends to be uh, a very common reaction from Muslims. And, and that's sometimes okay. It has its time and place. But I think it's more important to build on common ground. So if we can build on commonalities, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, instructs us, Allah says in Surah Al-Amran, chapter 3, verse 64, um, Qul ya O people of the scripture, ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum alla na'budu illallah. Come to a common term or come to commonalities that we worship the one true God and that we do not associate partners with him. So with Christians, it's most important to focus on the oneness of Allah, the oneness of God, right? So the oneness of God is really what you want to talk about. But again, you want to learn about the person, learn about their background. They may not be a practicing Christian. Uh, oftentimes we see Christians today because of the um, very deep decline uh, of Christianity in the West and the rise of new atheism we're, we're, we're obviously seeing that people aren't as interested in christianity as as they seem to be in the past in the past years so it would be interesting to learn more about what their stance is about christianity how much do they really believe in, in the christian doctrine and doctrine specifically like the trinity because most christians are trinitarian so how much do, do they adhere to christian doctrines and christian teachings and if they mm -hmm. believe in it strongly then I, then I think it's important to relate Islam, yeah. the Islamic uh, version of, of, of Allah, of God, yes. and see how you can perhaps build some common grounds. And if you can't, exactly. uh, then move on forward with exactly. other topics, okay. inshallah. Thank you. And, and I think you just met, you met, you had mentioned one thing before, you know, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, primary, so we have different topics that we're going to go through. So inshallah, if you continue to, to join us every Thursday at 9 p.m. Uh, here we will send you the, the reminder an hour before the, 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 the webinar. We have different topics as well, how to break ice and, and you know, transform regular talk into Dawah talk. But, um, and, and you continue, inshallah, again, this is a very new venture. It's a very dynamic venture. We have a lot of good speakers. 
So as you continue to learn um, to, to be with us, you'll be able to enhance your intellectual discourse, be able to provide information for the people, and uh, we'll go uh, step by step. Another question is, a very good question actually, is what advice would you give someone who is thinking about getting started in the DAO work? And how should uh, one take the first step to start doing DAO work and just, you know, general conversation and talking to people about Islam? How, you know, how would you, what Absolutely. would you advise them? Absolutely. So I think the first step would be to uh, learn more about DAO, which mashallah, the person has already taken the initiative to do so in attending this webinar. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them and reward everyone, in fact, who's attended and us all, I mean. Um, so secondly, what I would do is is de definitely um, focus on two main aspects, which is the the part that has to do with the hikmah, which is the intellect, and then the part about beautiful preaching. Both are just as important because one is about compassion and one is about intellect. So to build a compassionate understanding of dawah and the importance of it and how to relate to the to the you know human beings in our surroundings is is just as important as also gaining the background of Islam. So we need to learn about tawhid first and foremost is what I would advise because when when you think about it that's exactly what we're calling people to. There's three categories of tawhid we won't get into the details now, but when we learn about tawhid and its categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything that Allah has specific names and attributes due to him, and that Allah only is worthy of worship, then we can see where our Christian and atheist friends, and in fact, any other human who is not Muslim, where they fall short. Um, in addition to that, as uh, Brother Azad uh, just mentioned, that the Prophet ﷺ said, So we, we don't want to overwhelm us ourselves with knowledge, with, with the idea that we have to have a substantial amount of knowledge. We, need to, we should start with the basics for anyone who's interested in da'wah. Start with the basics. It's, prefer, it's preferable to have a mentor on board. So definitely um, tag team with someone who you feel that you can trust on the DAWA field. Attend one of the field DAWA sessions. If you can, attend even a formal workshop or continue on with this webinar, inshallah, till the end so that your experience in DAWA can also increase. So overall, there's a number of things that a person can do in order to be involved in this beautiful work of DAWA. Exactly. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, when we do Dawah, we have a lot of pamphlets and flyers, and you can find all of this on Why Islam uh, website, whyislam.org. Uh, and many of the topics or the questions, you know, can be answered. Like, for example, uh, concept of God in Islam, or Islam explained, or hijab in Islam, women in Islam, family in Islam, uh, Jesus in Islam. So if you go and you, you just read that pamphlet and that flyer, you can, you can download it, you can read it, you can order it, uh, share it, you know, hand it out to someone as well. So I'm going to send out um, this website. It's whyislam.org. You can go there. You can uh, find information about um, uh, the topics. And once you start reading it again, we, we have uh, more subjects that is coming up again. And, and this is the first uh, webinar of a series of webinars that's coming up. So inshallah, by the, by the time you finish with this first course, uh, which is about 13 classes, uh, you'll be able to, to see that giving da'wah or just talking to people in general about Islam, about um, you know the Prophet وسلم, will become very easy for you. And you, you would actually want to share this message because it's, it's like uh, the introduction says, you know, imagine, if you the quran says that you know saving a person's life in, in this world is as if you've saved all of man uh, humanity imagine my brothers and sisters imagine actually helping a person uh saving them from the hellfire in uh, making helping them go to paradise imagine the reward for that and you know the hadith and things like that will come up later on about some of the uh, benefits of that uh, inshallah. So one person, you know, they wanted to know how to give uh, da'wah to the Jehovah Witnesses it's coming to their house this weekend. Uh, again, I would say, I don't know, Mustafa, if you want to add, answer this or, you know, go to the website, wiseland.org, read up on the concept of God in Islam or Islam explained, and, and maybe you can start having a discussion there just to help. But if Mustafa, you want to answer right. that question. Right. I mean, just, just briefly, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, and I've had many discussions with them. I think we actually have uh, great intellectual 
multiple exchanges with them and uh, very interesting ones and also very friendly ones. But really, uh, dear attendees, we need to follow the same framework with anyone that we talk to initially. Of course, uh, there's different avenues that you'll end up uh, splitting into once you get more indulgent to the conversation with obviously depending on the person you're speaking to. But with Jehovah's Witnesses, just like anyone else, you want to start with the foundations, which is, you know, who is God? Obviously, yeah, who is God to you? Uh, do you believe in the oneness of God? Do you believe in uh, what is your presence? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they fall into something called anthropomorphism, which is they kind of make, they bring God into the human realm to, to some uh, level and extent. But we do have a lot of commonalities with them. And again, that just kind of goes back to building commonalities as well, right? Because they do believe in the prophethood of Isa. They don't believe that Isa was uh, crucified. There's so many commonalities that we share with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so I think it also takes, as Brother Zad was alluding to, it takes kind of uh, just kind of researching the concept of God and, and, and finding these primary source materials, making them available to you, studying them, so you can have these interesting dialogues with our Jehovah's Witnesses friends and Christian friends and really anyone. But we need to follow that same framework is the point. Start with Tawheed. Always make that your starting point and carry the conversation from there according to that person's worldview. And of course, as Brother Zed was saying, there's going to be special webinar sessions on each of these topics in more detail and things will get a little more technical and there will be strategic approaches to presenting this content to uh, the given person. Yes, yeah, thank you. And um, as, as we're finishing up here, um, someone is asking uh, where they can get the uh, the Dawah literature or material from, if you can go to our, to the website, whyislam.org, uh, there is abundance of uh, literature there. Uh, you can go and start reading them. Zakalokhe. Um, brothers and sisters, you know, I, I just want to make, maybe like, uh, give you one minute of, um, you know, a personal story of mine is initially, I, I actually wasn't practicing Muslim uh, and, and I grew up, I grew up in the, in South America, and I didn't know anything about Islam or Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And uh, you know, when I found Islam 22 years ago, I, you know, I, I, at a ripe age, I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't even know Al Fatiha. But you know, the love that I had and the zeal I had for for this Deen uh, and for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you know, encouraged me to to wanting to to learn and wanting to to uh, be able to to get closer to Allah. So. I started learning and you know it's kind of like so easy now I, I say for myself to talk to people about Islam and you know you can bring Islam from a, a different perspective even talking about you know somebody wants to talk about football and you can you can take that discussion and you, you can turn it into a, a conversation about a purpose of life or talking about the hereafter and things like that so we'll get into that more of that inshallah uh, as the sessions goes by uh, I encourage you to, to please stay with us, uh, you know, join us next week, uh, Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And, uh, you know, uh, we will have a little bit more uh, discussion and you'll enhance, like I said, you'll enhance your intellectual discourse. You'll be able to talk to people. And, and by the end of uh, some of these classes, uh, I'm sure people will feel confidence, uh, feel the confidence to wanting to, to share this uh, message of Islam, uh, the beautiful message of Islam, inshallah. Uh, so with that, inshallah, I don't know if you have any um, uh, any any last comment uh, about the Mustafa before we wrap up, inshallah. So Jazakumullah khair um, for all the attendees for attending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this uh, rewardful for you and fulfilling and continue to bless you all. And inshallah, if you continue with this work, you will not regret it. Due respect to yeah, brothers and sisters, absolutely. you will absolutely not regret it. So inshallah, uh, do stay tuned for the upcoming topics and Jazakum Khair for all your attention and time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and keep us consistent in this work. I mean, thank you very much. Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much. And inshallah, we will end uh, from here. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa and astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll uh, see you next Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.